right. So remember, if you are here, you are now in the live zone. Um, I am, this is the part of the recording that I would post. All right. So just a normal session. Tell me what you're going to do over in the chat box. Tell me what you hope to accomplish in this next 25 minutes. I'm setting the timer for 25 minutes. And remember, if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. All right, here we go. Okay, so uh, Meg is working on planners. Rebecca's writing goals for the kids and maybe herself too. Laura's working on her course of study. Oh, Jennifer's cleaning out her homeschool cart. Okay, so lots of good stuff going on here. Um, Colleen wants to know if you do content subjects in the morning. It, oh, no. Let me rephrase that. If you do content subjects in morning time, um, but want to do fun projects once a month or so for history, like make butter, do you find it easier to give up a morning time for the project or do you do it in free time or on Saturday? I think it depends. For me, it would depend on what actually gets done. So if it would actually, like if the only thing, my preference would be not to give up the morning time. My preference would be to do the morning time and then to set aside maybe like uh, Stephanie's fun Friday afternoons or something like that and do it then. But if it wasn't getting done, then my next thing would be to give up the morning time to make sure that it happened. Um, what about you, Lainey? Any thoughts on that one? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, I, I rarely give up morning time. Um, it's the staple of our day. It happens when nothing else does. Um, so often our morning time is at our table and it is, I'm not going to say it's quiet, but it's not as active. The kids are, you know, they'll have activities and things to do. So, but I'll tend to shuffle other things like if we need to do a project or something like that, then that would happen after our morning time. But I also might, like, I would prioritize morning time in our homeschool over having everybody break off and do their individual subjects. That project time might take the place of that in a particular day, if that makes sense. But okay. it wouldn't necessarily be like a super frequent thing. Right. Um, if it was going to be a frequent thing, then that wouldn't work because then people wouldn't be getting their individual work done. But that's kind of the way we do it. We don't have a lot of days where we're going to do like a huge project -y type day. Okay. Yeah. And I think once a month, that would be fine. So Lainey's saying, forget the math and do the project instead and keep your morning time. I kind of tend to agree. Um, okay. So somebody had a really good idea. I think it was was it Dawn Simpson? Oh, yes. I'm planning to extend morning time to include projects and experiments. And so maybe that's what you do is like that once a month, have like super morning time where you do, you could even shorten your regular morning time stuff a little bit, but still have it because it keeps that cap, you know, that kind of uh, rhythm going. But then, uh, you know, instead of doing like two readings or something, just do one and then extend it and have all your project stuff there and say, okay this is the time that we're going to now do the butter churning. And I'm telling you, while they're sitting there churning the butter, you can be reading them something. So it, it's kind of a perfect, not every project's going to work out like that, but there are a lot of art projects and special projects where they need time to work. So you might as well be reading aloud to them. So, well, and I, I think that was one of the things like for our morning time, we all come together. That's the, that is the hinge that that's the point where everybody actually comes together in my household. Yeah. If they're all working on their individual things, it's very difficult for me to get them to come. It, like they just know, like whenever I start that morning time playlist, it's time for everybody to move into that space of, okay, now we're working. It's, it's just a mental trigger to them. that says, okay, now it's cool time. It's one of the reasons why I very rarely actually drop morning time because they need it for their like, oh, it's time to do school. If they right. haven't had that, right. then they tend to just think, well, no, we can still do what we want. 
So we have our morning time, but it may be a shortened version if I know if we're going to do like an art project or a science experiment or something that's going to take longer after that. But it does happen usually like right after that morning time, they've been sitting still and quiet for some readings and then they're ready to get up and move. But if it's a project like that, they're going to be more interested in sticking around. I won't, I don't have to like coerce my kids to stick around for science experiments. They're always excited about that stuff, but it does happen directly after morning time. It's just that in our home, if other things are going to be dropped because of time, it'll be their individual work rather than their morning time. Love it. Okay. So Laura wants to know course of study. I know what I'm using. She's using AO. So do you use the course of study sheets for AO when everything is included except for math, which she has? So I would not fill out a sheet. That's not helpful to me, Laura, just for the sake of filling out a sheet. So if like, there's nothing on that sheet that you could look at and it would be helpful for you. I just wouldn't worry about it. I think what Dawn, who uses AO, would say if she were here would be that she would use the course of study sheet because sometimes it's, and she finds this out when she's writing her goals, there's something missing in AO that she needs to help her meet that goal. So uh, if, you know, if that were the case, you could do something under subject where you said, you know, this is for this goal and now this is how often we're going to do it. So only fill out the form if it's useful. So if you're just totally sticking to AO and you don't need it, don't worry about filling it out. Yeah, I have um, all three of them want to start some music lessons, which are not in AO. So that would be something that I would put on there then for them. Yeah, yeah, that would be something you would include. Just anything that's, you know, something additional you're having to add because AO is not meeting that goal that you have for that kid. So. Okay. Don, that's so great to read about your uh, change. And I think Don Simpson saying in the comments that her teens are fine doing morning time if it counts towards their school day. Yeah, I we try to put we don't just try to put fluffy extra things in morning time. We try to put things in morning time that are going to kind of check that box for them. So, um, Rebecca says the goals I have for my kids all qualify as week goals, but I feel as though I don't have enough sense of how the school year will look in order to make these goals stronger. Does it make sense to move ahead with the week goals and then circle back at a later point, or should I try to make them specific now and adjust them when I realize it isn't working? Um, well, thinking about and, and we might have to look at some of these in the community. Like I might have to have you post some of these in the community and let me kind of look at them and read them a little bit to help you out with this. But um, since the purpose of goals is to guide you and to make sure that you're prioritizing the things that, you know, you... And it's not even prioritizing the things that are most important, though it is, but it's like to make sure you're prioritizing something, to make sure you're not living under this false belief that I can equally do all the things in my homeschool for each of my children, for all of my children, right? And that's the purpose of goals. It's like, I like what is not going to fall through the cracks? And so um, I would definitely get like, even if you'd feel like you can't get a really good goal written down at this moment, like what is not going to fall through the cracks is number one. So I would just make a list of the three things that's not going to fall through the cracks for each kid. And then I would look at, okay, um, how can I make sure that these are things within my control? I think that's the next important thing. Like don't get all wrapped up about making them specific and measurable first. Make, make sure that you're like, okay, how am I making a goal that I can control this? So, you know, back to Laura's narration goal from earlier, let's make sure that the goal is we're going to do an oral narration every day, not that nor narration is going to equal X outcome, right? So first step is at least list three things so you know what you're prioritizing. Second step is, um, you know, make sure that it's something within your control then go back and worry about making them specific and measurable. So you could write what we would call like 
ugly goals or sloppy goals or something like that just to get you started. Uh, but I think the most important thing is having something to focus on. Another question I sometimes ask myself when I'm struggling with exactly how to word a goal is, what am I going to do to move forward towards this goal? And like the narration example, I, it would be actually doing the narration. So it's not so much that you're focusing on the outcome as much as it is, what is it that I'm going to do to make forward progress towards that end goal? If yeah. I write just broad categories, I, I get real sloppy with how I execute. I need the process of the goal writing to help me with my personal executive function skills to be able to um, guide and direct all the kids in what they're having to do. Because I have so many different kids that all have different things they need to be focusing on. And it's easy for those moving parts to get lost if I don't have something that is written for me to remember like, oh, I need to do phonics with this child every day or I need to do. And it is kind of like you said, you have to pick those focus areas because we're only one person with however many kids you have. And there are a lot of tasks that have to be done. In that. And so to pick those focus areas. So it's kind of like what Pam talked about at the beginning of this finishers club session with the Pomodoro thing. You can write a vague like, oh, I'm going to do module one, but it might be hard for you to accomplish and get started unless you're writing something a little bit more specific about what you're going to be doing in that moment. And so it doesn't have to be, I think it's easier to like try something and then, then go back and tweak it if it's yeah. not working yeah. to see. But for me personally, it really helps to have that kind of, I guess like it almost like an action step of like, what is, what does this look like? How, where, what am I going to actually do to move forward in this? And that's often what I'm going to do, not what my kids are going to do. Yeah. And that's what we, you know, we talk about these being goals for our kids, but I think that's what came out when we were having the conversation with Courtney earlier about who should be writing the goals. Should it be the moms or should it be the kids? And these really are moms goals for the moms about that kid, <laughs> you know, is really what it, yeah, is a little more what it is. And I don't think we've, we've ever quite expressed it like that before. So yes, Don Simpson goals can help reduce overwhelm to remind you when all the needs can crush you that what you are doing is important and making progress. Yes. Yep. Okay. So Betsy says I'm writing goals for nine children, grades one through 11. Should I stick to just one or two goals per child? Is that enough? Yes, because that's probably all you're going to be able to really prioritize for each child. Um, you know, I don't have nine kids. Lainey, Lainey gets close. <laughs> and so she can tell you, yeah, that's pretty much all you're going to be able to do. And the other thing with that is I will say that there are like seasons of, of things. Like sometimes, I mean, you know, one to two one to two goals for nine kids. I mean, you're looking at, you're looking at 18 goals there that you may not actually have the capacity to work on 18 goals at one time. And that's actually one of the things Pam and I talked about in the last um, podcast episode about summer, the, the summer reading program. My, when I have little kids that are learning to read, it is very difficult for me to focus on doing those daily lessons with them when I have so many other kids that are having more advanced work and things. So I kind of carve out the summer for teaching kids to read where they get that one-on-one -on -one time with mom every day and we could focus on that. But my bigger kids are not doing school and they need less of me at that time. Yeah. So I think sometimes yeah. we just have to recognize that your capacity is what it is. And we can't fit everything in at all times. And picking those focus areas, especially when you have a lot of kids is really important because then you can feel confident in the fact that you're getting you know, through things. But it may be that some of this term planning that we do is important for that because I know in this, you know, in this six week term, these kids may get priority because they need a lot of handholding from mom and we're gonna really hit a particular subject or a particular skill hard with lots of repetition and then in the next six week period they're going to have more time to build that skill and to 
really work on it more independently. Um, it's not that you don't give any feedback, but it just may be that we're not having those really intensive learning new things that have to have that constant repetition for. Um, because you're gonna, you're already gonna have math and things like that. That unless you have a math theory, you're gonna be teaching your kids math all year long. You're going that you have enough things that you're going to be doing that for. So sometimes we have to do that. And is it doesn't Sarah McKenzie address that in her teaching from West book where she'll ch she'll choose like this is the thing that we're doing yeah. right now for the yeah. last six weeks, and then after we we're done that, then we'll move to the next thing. And it's that constant assessing like oh they really need help with writing right now and so that's where we're going to put most of our effort but then it'll change and then so I think initially like at the beginning of my school year when I write out goals for my kids it's what do I want to hear or what do I want to focus on for each child for the entire scope of the school year but then recognizing that that doesn't necessarily mean that every week of the entire school year is going to be directly focused on those particular goals. I might have to go back and prioritize terms, block scheduling, those types of things in which we want to highlight, you know what, these three kids are gonna get this focus this term and these three kids are gonna get this focus this term. Yeah, yeah. And Betsy, um, I'm gonna try to think about where Heather Tully and I have talked about it, you know, cause Heather's a mom of 10 and she talks about looping her kids. Um, and so like she has a time in the afternoon, first of all, she combines as much as she can. So if she's got some kids who are really close in age, she might combine these three for language arts or these three for this, or these two for this. And then she has a time in the afternoon where, um, you know, time set aside that she's going to loop through groups of children. So she, she has her loop list and she brings these three kids over and does the next lesson in this. And then they go, and then they bring, you know, she brings this kid over and does a lesson of this. And then that kid goes and, you know, she might have five or six little groups or kids. And this is all for teaching those teacher intensive subjects that she needs to be sitting beside them for. Um, you know, like a uh, teaching kids to read or like working through math or like, you know, giving them extra math help or whatever. And then like she loops through as many as she can end of the day, she closes it the next day she opens up and she starts with the next group of kids on the list and then loops back up to the top. And so she can't get to, you know, everybody might not get a, a, a reading lesson every single day, but they're probably getting it every other day because she's working her way down that loop. So, and I think that's a great big family strategy. Yeah, I used to loop my kids when I had like three high schoolers and then three non-readers. I we did loop the kids, and then I had some more kids that were a little bit more independent in the middle. Even those high schoolers, you have to have touch points with them. You, I mean, you you probably have things you need to be grading, you need to be giving them feedback on. You may even have certain classes that you're teaching them on. They're not totally independent all the time. And so I would just have a list. Um, I would have a loop for each child that would list out the things that we would need to do in kind of a one-on-one -on -one time. And then the kids were looped. And so I might meet with two high schoolers today and another one tomorrow. And then we would do reading lessons with little kids, but it did keep a consistent flow for all the different people that were needing. And that time, for, especially for older kids, was always reserved for things they needed direct feedback from me on. Maybe we were doing math corrections. Maybe we were learning a new science concept. Or, um, you know, I was going to give them feedback on their writing if they had turned in a paper that I had graded, but I felt like I needed to communicate with them um, about what I wanted to see. So it was always like the highlighted, like, what is the most important thing I need to kind of like go over with this child. And then for my younger kids, it was always, what do they need mom for? So that was where we were going to do our short phonics lesson. Maybe we were going to do spelling. Maybe we we're gonna do their math worksheet together while I sat there. That way I could see that they were, or if they needed to read aloud to me still before they were really fluent. Yeah, about six minutes left guys, about six minutes. I wanted to make sure that we, uh, good job, Rebecca, on your working on that uh, vision. 
I want to make sure we don't miss anything. And Rebecca, like you're, you're, do, you said you've been doing hybrid and so you're switching to full time and you don't know what's actually going to work. And so, yeah, like you may like totally scrap. <laughs> so like you're completely, it's a pretty big shift for you. And so, yeah, you may at one of the review sh- sessions, the sep- depending on when you start the September or October review session, you may say, okay, we're like kind of switching things up now, but that's what those review sessions are for. Okay. Um, Jennifer said, my son is starting high school. We love the morning time explorations. I'm unsure how to keep doing those type of unit studies and still have time for all the school courses and to get his hours done and not be doing school all day long. Can you talk a little bit more about what you include and don't include with your morning time for your teens? Yes, I can, but I have an even better thing to tell you. So Andrew Pudua and Sarah McKenzie have been doing a session this year. And the best line to come out of it is Andrew Pudua says for your transcript, do what you want, call it what you must. And I'm just going to leave that out there. Do what you want, call it what you must. And so that is my new motto for high school. We are going to do what we want and we're going to call it what we got to call it to write a transcript Um, because it's so much more important for me. Now, you know, you've definitely got to look at where your kids are going. What do they want to do with their life and how can I best prepare them for the next stage? And that's, that's basically what it boils down to. So if you have a kid who is definitely college bound, they want to get into, you know, a a big college, they want to take hard classes, you've got to prepare them for that. But, um, you know, you've got a lot of freedom and flexibility. So I include in my morning time this year. So what we did, and I haven't, I've kind of started thinking about next year, but what we did this year was um, we did, uh, you know, prayer, current events. We did literature in morning time. I basically literature for was reading aloud and discussing and we did it in morning time and we all did it together. Um, C.S. Lewis had that quote about good books being good for young and old people. There you go. Um, and then we did uh, a little bit of like catechism church kind of stuff. Um, we did po- We did our memor- memorization we sang folk songs. Um, and so those are kinds of things which are not necessarily going on a transcript, though I could put a humanities credit on the transcript. I think my kids could get a humanities credit for the four years of morning time that we've done, um, including that kind of stuff. Um, and then we did history and geography in morning time. And so we did our spine reading for history in morning time. And that was all that my sixth grader did was listen to that. And then my high schoolers had an additional resource that they used at a different time of day, which was very much just kind of a get it done kind of history uh, where they read the the page and answered the questions. So um, that was what we did. Yeah, and to add to that, I always make sure everything we do in morning time for high schoolers counts towards their transcript in some way. And sometimes that does take a little bit of looking at what are they doing and in, in actually breaking that down into categories. So my kids, some of my kids have had like on their high school transcripts, they'll have like, like a Bible or a theology type credit. And part of that credit is going to come from like our catechism study that we do during morning time. Um, they all have some sort of fine arts credit and that can come from like the composer studies that we do during morning time as well as picture studies that we do at morning time um and it's not necessarily that they get a full credit for a whole year of morning time or one semester of morning time or something but it is the cumulative addition of going over those things and then I can look at that and very solidly say, yeah, they have done more than, you know, what would be required for a credit given the span of time that they have been doing these small pieces. Yeah. So yeah. you can look at the individual things you're doing in morning time and see how would that break out. And that is kind of what I think Andrew Poudois is talking about when he says, call it what you must. It, you know, you can look at it and, okay, well, where would this piece fit um, on a transcript if I want to count it for that. So the explorations would be a great example of that because you're going to have all kinds of different things that go into that, including science topics. Our next two, our next two explorations that are coming out are ponds and then after that are going to be light. So you've got 
you know, biology, microbiology and biology topics in the ponds one. And then you've got physical science in the light one. Those are yeah. things that can be counted towards those yeah. upper level science classes. And, and I will tell you that the heart of explorations is truth, goodness, and beauty. So they're not meant to be unit studies. So there's, there's always art. We always include art. There is always music. There is always, um, uh, nature study, which, you know, is a, a little more sciencey. So, you know, you, you could, I would think like you could give your kid a nature study credit. I don't know. You'd have to figure out time set, by the way, figure out what you were going to call that. Um, but, um, because I think when making a transcript, the more you keep things normal, just the easier it is. So like, you know, somebody said like, and I think it's Heather Woody, like, don't make up classes and write these elaborate course descriptions, just call it botany, right? You know, just call it botany. So maybe nature study becomes about, you know, part of a bot, part of a biology credit, not the whole biology credit, but part of one. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the explorations. It could certainly be fine arts or, or humanities or something like that, a portion of one of those credits. And that was the most freeing thing for me before we sign off and go. That was the most freeing thing for me about high school is to realize, oh, I could take something we did over all the years of high school and put it in a year and give it a name and give them a half credit or a credit for it. You don't, it doesn't have to be like what we did in ninth grade. So that was a, a big freeing thing for me. So yay, Ruth Ann, she got the most done during this session. Yeah. Tell me what you accomplished over here, please. Um, so <laughs> that's funny that you get more things done while people are talking <laughs> because you're used to people talking. I love it. So, all right. Well, our next session will be on Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Time. It will be led by Lainey. I probably will not be here. I, I, occasionally, I might pop into one of these other sessions, but we have some fabulous mentors this year. Um, Lainey, uh, Lena Sutherland is going to be here. So those are the days to bring your my kids won't get along questions because Lena is your lady for that. And then Don Garrett is going to be leading some of them as well. So good job. First term of art lessons planned out supply list, finished planners signed up for an online course, um, wrapped up odds and ends. Love it. Almost done with goals for one child. Got your course of study done. Good work, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for being here and uh, Lainey, we'll see you on Thursday. So have a good day. Have a good rest of your weekend.